Hello, welcome to this very special edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at the Jazz Standard here in New York City. Tonight blessing the band stage in a very rare and personal solo performance is Grammy-nominated vocalist Andy Bay. If you might recall, Mr. Bay has had a very profound and prolific career recording with the likes of he and his sisters Geraldine and Salome, as well as Gary Bartz, as well as Horace Silver, just to name a few. We sat down earlier and we talked about his 2013 Grammy-nominated recording, The World According to Andy Bay, which is on the High Note Records in print, as well as talk about him growing up in Newark, New Jersey. We also sat down and dissected some of his major influences, both in jazz vocal as well as piano and we also talked about the rudiments of what makes Andy Bay keep going at his age. So sit back, relax and enjoy the sounds of a rare and very personal and intimate performance from Mr. Andy Bay live here at the Jazz Standard here in New York City. <laughs> Congratulations on your brand new CD, The World According to Andy Bay. This is a beautiful and very personal CD. Thank you very much, Brian. Well, it, it's personal for me in many ways because it's like almost like coming home to something that I've always done, which is sing and play the piano. You know, but in a certain way that's personal in a sense that I'm doing stuff the way I used to do it. I mean, you can never go totally back. You go back to move forward. And that's the way I see it. Because I've always wrote music and, you know, and I've always tried to do my own thing. But it's different because it's kind of an up CD. You know, it shows me doing a lot of bright tunes and faster tempos that I've always done, you know. But you can get pigeonholed, you know, doing 
other stuff with other people from time to time because they see it in another way. And not that I don't see that other way, but uh, I'm a lot broader than that, you know, just, you know, hearing me this way or that way. And I'm glad I'm, I did this CD because it, it like shows some things that I haven't been doing in a while. You know, Andy, one of the things about the CD is that, and you said it, it's an up CD, which it is, but it also kind of reconnects you with the piano. I mean, you're doing some really innovative things with the piano, something that is kind of lost with the jazz vocal type style pianist and uh, performers. Yeah, well, you know, I've always been into different concepts of music, you know, you know, you know, modern classical music, you know, like Stravinsky and Bartok and stuff like that. And I've always been interested in this sort of dissonance because I had been working on, you know, 12 tonal things. I mean, I didn't do a lot of solos, soloing on this record, but it wasn't that, it, it wasn't supposed to be that as much as trying to get the music across. But in terms of accompanying myself, I try to use some stuff that's interesting to me in terms of, you know, using different triads and voicing them in certain ways to get a certain kind of sound, which I've been working on for a long time. <laughs> so I'm glad I got a chance to do some of it on this CD. You know, I didn't do a lot because I didn't. I, I recorded six originals, but only three of them made the CD. But it'll be it'll be released for another time, I guess you know. But I'm I'm just I'm always interested in, in pushing the envelope in a way that feels, you know, feels good to me. You know, it feels that I'm that feels interesting. I mean, even if it doesn't, even if it doesn't sound like conventional, I'm not really interested in what sound conventional or non-conventional. You know, if I hear something. You know, I'm, I'm going to try it, go for it, you know. So this is all I'm trying to do is, you know, just try to, you know, try to express some of the stuff that I've been working on for the last 50 years. You know, Andy, you are in this great elite class of jazz luminaries. You, Freddie Cole, and John Hendricks. And one of the things that you've done is, and you've maintained this throughout your career, piano and vocal. Why do you think that that has become a lost art form in jazz music right now? Uh, I think one of the reasons, you know, it's, up, it's really up to the artists. You know, if you're a young artist, sometimes, you know, record pro producers and promoters and, you know, managers have a way of telling you what you think you should do or what's going to be popular or what's going to be, what's not commercial or, you know, not, you know, not, it's got to be a certain thing in the, in the business. You know, if it sounds like something else that's familiar, then they can deal with it. But if it's come, if it crosses the boundary a bit and it's a little out there, you know, they might, you know, be scratching their heads and wondering what it is. You know, but they don't have a clue as to what the music is about, period. You know, but yet and still they can tell people what they think you should do or what, what's right for them or what's right for the market. You know, but that's, you know, this is why you got American Idols and all those things and the voice, because it's like instant this, instant success, instant, you know, you got all these people that sound the same and that are doing the same thing. And, and as long as you got enough of that, you know, that, and if you look a certain way, you know, it's about marketing more than about music. You know, but it's up to the individual. You got to be able to, if you feel something that's a muse that's strong in you that you believe in, I'm not saying that, you know, you can't, it's not about compromising, but it's about, you know, you do what you have to do in order to survive, but you can still hold on to what it is you, you believe in and what inspires you. Because after all is said and done, I mean, if you go out there and make a hit record and make a, and make a million dollars, that's not the answer. 
you know, if you're not, they'll still keep you, they'll, they'll say, well, you do this for now, and then maybe later on you can do something that you, you know, you can do your thing, you know, but it's not about that because they don't never want you to do your thing. <laughs> it ain't necessarily so. sisters but one of the things that I want to know about is growing up who were some of the musical influences that really kind of woo you on the piano as well as the vocal oh wow of course I mean once I got into jazz I mean I mean I was always into the music you know I listened to Bud Powell I listened to all the great ones I listened to Art Tatum I listened to Hara Silver, I listened to Hank Jones, I listened to uh, Errol Ghana, was really the one that kind of like, you know, much as I loved his style, I never tried to emulate him, because who can emulate Errol Ghana or Art Tatum or anybody? But Errol Ghana, you know, epitomized joy, so much joy and so much great virtuosity in his playing and so much swing. So that really took a hold on me, you know. Oscar Peterson was another one. And uh, oh God. It's a, it's been a lot, you know, but it's been it's been a lot of people, you know, like Tommy Flanagan. But uh, I was Earl Garner that really got into my spirit, you know. He really, and Mary Lou Williams, 
I used to see her on the Tonight Show from time to time. And, you know, just, you know, the boogie boogie piano players like her, uh, Albert Ammons and her, uh, Mead Lux Lewis and all of those people. Then you, later on you listen to, I mean, there's the McCoy Tanners and the Keith Jarrett's and the, uh, the, the Bill Evans. I mean, I dug Bill Evans' concept, you know, but it was those, the, you know, the main influences was like, definitely like, like a uh, Bud and, her, uh, and then Monk. Monk was so unique. And then, you know, Hank Jones and Oscar and, you know, those were the people that I saw on television that I could relate to. It, you know, it wasn't that many times you could see black artists on TV. But Steve Allen had a show called The Tonight Show. And he would have these people on his, his program from time to time, you know. So I get a chance to see Sarah Vaughn. I happened to see Billie Holiday live on the spot that in Harlem. This was like 1950. And then people like Louis Jordan influenced me, you know, in terms of his, his musicality, in terms of his ability to play serious music. And Nat King Cole, I for, how could I forget Nat King Cole? He was really a huge influence on me, you know, pianistically and uh, vocally and, you know, just his whole demeanor, you know, his, his taste, you know. And Billy Eckstein, you know, all these people that I got a chance to see as a kid, you know, I've seen them, Sarah, and I saw Ella Fitzgerald, who I loved, Betty Carter, oh God, Dinah Washington, who I've seen quite a few times, Ruth Brown, you know, all the blues singers, you know, like, you know, like B.B. and Bobby Blue Bland and, and her, uh, Amos Milburn and her, uh, what's this, this other guy who was a, the poet of the blues, Percy Mayfield. Mm. Mm. It, was, it was something. Because my sister, I had a sister that loved the blues. So she would have the, all these records, Wynoni Harris. But there was a singer in Newark that I talk about from time to time. I don't know whether he, he was, re, he recorded a little bit. But I met him when I was really young. His name was Andrew Tibbs. But I know he died kind of young. And there was another singer named Lester Harris who sang with the Railvax, you know, who I, who I liked very much as a kid. And then Nate Brown was another singer who I saw in Newark. Because Newark was sort of a melting pot, you know. Uh, you know, I had, you know, I had, a lot of these people kind of nurtured me when I was a kid because I started very young. I mean, I was doing gigs when I was five and six years old. Life was lonely again. And only last year, everything seemed so. And now in life is awful again. A truffle of heart could only be. Yeah. 
face to smile in growing up in Newark, I understand that you knew the Shorter Brothers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they, you know, the weird Shorter Brothers they used to call them. <laughs> yeah. But they were very talented. Alan passed on later on, but uh, Wayne is like six years older than me. He's the same age as my sister Salome. They'll be 80 this year. But, uh, um, Wayne has always been very, very unique and very talented. I mean, he was playing great when he was about 18 years old and writing, but then I, I knew him before he went with Art Blakey, actually. You know, but I knew that he was going to be, diff be great because he had it all together in terms of composition and arranging and playing and just, you know, all of that, you know. And he was very intellectual, very smart. And Alan was kind of like one of the, I mean, he was talented also, but he was a little different. He was a little more out than Wayne <laughs> in some ways. But uh, they were nice people, boy. Because they played in, this, in the band, Nat Phipps's band, with my sister who, who used to sing in that band, you know. That's how I got to know Wayne, because he's like six years older than me. And uh, it take because I used to go to uh, the rehearsals when I was like twelve or thirteen, maybe a little younger than that. And I used to see them, you know, because when you when you're twelve and they're eighteen, even that that seems like a far distance. But as you get older, it's very close. <laughs> <laughs> One more time. Did you do it? 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 Did you do
sisters you were out there doing it way before anybody else was doing it what was it about getting and hooking up with Geraldine and Salome that took you guys from Newark and went overseas and then built your following over there before you came to the states well well circumstances you know you and you were a family you lived together and uh, after I had gotten out of my adolescence. There's a, there was another thing that, there was another growing process, you know, but I kept developing, you know, with, because I was a child protege. But then, you know, things change, you know. I mean, you're not the same little kid who was 13 years old, <laughs> so you develop in another way, you know. But it just so happened I just kept developing and they were singing you know, they were doing little gigs and they had other aspirations to do this and that. But somehow, they started singing duo for a while. And uh, we made some records, you know, sort of R&B inspired, if you might call. I mean, but we, were, we were always influenced by jazz because jazz music was always in the house. You know, but... Uh, I was playing the piano and working on things, and, and somehow we, it started happening, because I was playing for them. I used to accompany them, you know, on, especially Salome. I used to go to her high school and play for her, because we would learn things. I was a good, I had a very good ear when I was a kid, you know, and that's what helped me to hear chord structures and stuff, and being able to hear stuff, you know, that wasn't, as normal as somebody else. I mean, even though I had a little training later on, but basically all of that stuff came natural to me, you know, boogie woogie and all that, because you're listening, you're like a sponge. And then it just kept developing, because I kept listening. I mean, it didn't, it didn't stop at a certain point where you, well, I got a little disinterested after a while, but I needed to, um, I guess I needed to go out and play th with the guys or whatever, you know, play tag or whatever you would always want to be playing, <laughs> or, or, or our version of baseball or skating. Or, but then, you know, when I came back to it, I got stronger. And I got stronger in it, you know, because I never left it. You know, it was always something there that kept me in music, you know. Andy, those first, well, the first record was on RCA, but the other two records that you guys recorded on Prestige, yes. you had Kenny Burrell, Milt Hinton, Ossie Johnson. You had some heavyweight jazz yeah, guys. Mr. Davis and Joe Jones. I mean, Papa Joe Jones. Yeah. It's very clear. <laughs> <laughs> Together we're going a long, long way. The radio and the telephone. Yeah. 
We just be passing, passing fantasies And time may go But oh my dear Our love is here to stay music mean to you well it's something that is it's not a thing it's a spirit and there's something that you know like people make all these all these talks about saving jazz and and or, uh, but it's that's a lot of egotism because they're making it a, po a political thing well jazz is just a feeling that will never will live in spite of all your fundraising and all your this and that and you know talking about jazz is dead and meanwhile you're killing it because you're not really giving you're not really listening you're trying to, you're listening to yourself talk and you're not really dealing with the music you know the same people that talking about they you know they love it you know it, you know it's about their ego because, you know, jazz didn't need no help. It's about you, the individual, that needs the help. <laughs> you know, if you focus enough on the music, the music will take you where it's going to take you anyway. You know, but you can't, you know, you got to, now you got to get a, a manager, you got to get an agent, you got to get email, you got to get this, you got to get Z-mail. And uh, all of this stuff that had nothing to do with the music. All this focusing on what you don't have and what should be is taking you away from your concentration. And this is what the world wants you to, wants you to keep. They want you to be distracted with all the stuff, the, the politics and all the, and not only with, with just the politics of the world and the business, you know, telling you that you got to do this, you got to sound this way. You know, you, you're not technical enough. You don't look good enough. You know, you don't, you're not, you don't fit an image. Because this all had to do with politics. It had nothing to do with the music. Because if it did, you know, you wouldn't be doing fundraisers. You wouldn't be trying to save jazz. You know, but you got to stop begging these people that don't want to save jazz. <laughs> I mean, all they want is politics and, you know, they want their version of what it is. You know, but, it, but the real deal is the real deal. And that will, if, if we just believe in something much higher than ourselves, get ourselves out of the way and let something else higher take over other than just all the politics in the world and music. That'll do it again for another edition of the Pace Report, reporting live here at the Jazz Standard here in New York City. I'd like to personally thank the talented Mr. Andy Bay for his time, as well as the staff for managing me here at the Jazz Standard for their warm hospitality. As always, please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com, for my weekly column as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Till next time, Peace. It's very clear. I'm loving here to stay. Together we're going a long, long way.
telephone and the movies that we used to know.